for the wrath. Then I advise you to go into Sodom and Gomorrah where Lot and his family were pulled away before the wrath. There are other examples in the scriptures where the nation of Israel was protected, like the Jericho, where they were protected seven times. They went in, captivated that city, but God protected them from the wrath. And there's so many examples where God protects his people from the wrath, so it makes no sense. And it, it just, I'll, I, there are many verses where the Bible says that we are not appointed to suffer the wrath of God in 1 Thessalonians 5 9. Yes. Uh, I, so it makes absolutely no sense. And the 144,000 will be the ones comforting and witnessing during that time will be in heaven with the Lord. So I don't understand your reasoning or logic. It's not a worldwide event, it's only for the nation of Israel. The tribulation will engulf the rest of the, of the world. Introduction to Ultimate Evil. This evening, and I'm going to preface it by a warning. I never do this, but I feel led to do this this evening. When I was by myself at home studying and looking over this, I was very at peace and calm because this is God's word, but I was very unnerved by some of the things that I was studying. And the reason I am is if you have been watching, if you have been here the last few weeks, you have seen and heard things that the Spirit of God has shown you. And it's alarming. And what you're going to hear tonight is going to be even more alarming. When you talk about Revelation 13, you're talking about the introduction to the ultimate figure of evil that the world has ever seen. You have you Benito Mussolini's, Joseph Stalin's, Saddam Hussein's, Osama bin Laden's, the the Roman Emperor, the, the Roman Caesars of Rome back then. You have all your so called Antichrist, Adolf Hitler, you have all the world's evil in history. That fails in comparison to the individual who will come upon the scene. He is the ultimate evil that will come on this earth. But I don't want you to be afraid because Jesus will take us home. We don't have to go through this. But I do want you to be very careful and concerned for those that may be left behind. If you don't get jacked right with God, you will be left behind. And I, we as a church are not going to coddle you and try to smooth things over and make you... And in, in other words, this is an urgent message. Everything has been fulfilled in Matthew 24 and in most scriptures in Daniel. The 70th week is upon us. If you look at the Jewish calendar, we are approaching the seventh dispensation period. Seven always represents peace and prosperity. Not the worldly peace and prosperity, but God's peace and prosperity. God is going to reward us spiritually, heavenly. He will bless us worldly to get by, but He will reward us spiritually. There's a big difference in that. The, the foot soldiers of the Antichrist are already at work and have been at work. He uses false teachers and false prophets, cults, satanic organizations to lead people away from Christ and they are doing the work of the devil. If you go to church and if your church does not teach the truth from God's word solely, you are in the wrong church. People have said, Pete, you cannot say that. We were talking earlier about NSA, about the government in our conversations. I really believe if they had a shot at me, they would try to get me out. Because I'm speaking something 
that no, they say, you know what, this crazy guy, we got to get him out. Because he's saying something that if it catches on, people are going to listen. And here's the part. False teachers and prophets have been infiltrated from the very beginning. This is not a, a New Testament thing. This goes back to Genesis. The first Antichrist is Nimrod. From Nimrod, everything has flowed and come from then. And we have showed you on the board, we have showed you historically, every empire has had the major force of religion behind them with the government. And who controls that false religion? It is the devil. Religion and government, they will tell you that there's a separation of church and state, right? That is the greatest lie of all. There is a force, there is a force of church and state. But once we have studied this and get together with this, you're going to find out it's not what you think. That's another lie. The church has always wanted to dictate its orders to the government. Which church has always had their finger on the government? Which church has always had a say in the government? Which church has had pull with the government? Which church is the most powerful religion in the world and actually dictates to lawmakers what can pass and not pass? How many of you went every Friday had fish in the lunchroom? Why? I wanted my beef. Where's my beef? Where's the beef? Then you find out, and I was told as I got older, well, it's a religious thing to say like it is. The church controlled what we ate. That's a small example of what is going on. Do you remember Blue Sundays? When stores were closed Blue on Wall, Sunday? Yeah. Who do you think repealed that? Who do you think were the ones that said, you know what, businesses have a right to open on Sundays? Do you think it was the government? Who do you think started Blue Sundays? It was the government through the people, right? Who do you think repealed that? Which religion condones drinking? Which religion says it's alright to drink? You know who I'm talking about. They got a repeal. We're going to study here in the, in the next few weeks that evil has many disguises. Evil can be a philosophy. Liberalism is evil. When you advocate abortion, that's evil. When you advocate gay marriage, that's evil. Not according to Pete, no, I have nothing to do with this. I'm just the messenger. That's all I am. You have to go to God who tells you the truth. And he says it's a sin, it's a sin. You don't legalize sin to make it right. It's still a sin. You can dress a pig up in nice blue dress and a tiara, but it's still a pig. You cannot change what it is. You cannot change evil. Evil is evil. The only one that could change evil to good is the power of Jesus Christ. His power can change it. But if you look here, we're dealing with people that don't want to change. We're dealing with people that have an agenda. We're dealing with people that are doing the work of the devil. Am I being dramatic? I hope I am. I don't want to come across as someone casual and someone overcome, you know, this stuff here. I want to talk to you about it. I want passion in this. I want to convey to you that this is serious. Because to God, it is serious. To us, it may not be. But to God, it's very serious. God cares. God does care, and also the devil. And see, that's the one thing that we need to remember. God cares, but so does the devil. We're the ones that are caught in the middle. Let's look at your outline here this evening. What does God say about false teachers and prophets? These are just four of many verses that will tell you about false teachers and prophets. The controlling element of evil. Sin Listen carefully. Sin controls life without the power of Jesus. I want to say that again. Sin controls life 
Sin is not a once in a while thing. Sin is an everyday thing. And unless Jesus Christ, if he did not intervene with his blood sacrifice, and the Holy Spirit did not intervene through the process of sanctification, and if God did not choose us to salvation, sin will eventually kill us. For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Churches that do not make a big deal of sin are doing the devil's work. You cannot, and I've said this so many times until people are, the, re, the day that I stop saying this is the day I go home to the Lord when I'm raptured. Sin is of the devil. Look at 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. And I'm not I'm gonna I'm gonna quote it to you. I'm not gonna even say it, but I want you to look up 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. Sin is real. The Antichrist would have you believe there is no such thing as sin. The Antichrist would come upon the scene and say that the church was a reality. They used sin to scare people, now they're gone. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says what? About sin. He who denies sin, those that say that there is no such thing as sin, right? No. First John chapter one. First John chapter one. Verse eight. What did they say about sin? Oh, here we go. If we say that we have no sin. If we say that we have no sin, Sorry, the sorry. truth of God is not in us, right? Mm -hmm. And we what? We make them out to be a liar. Yeah. If we say that we have no sin. The truth is not in us, and we make God to be a liar. Did I quote that right or about right? Yeah. Okay. First John chapter one verse eight is your key verse in this in this chapter, Revelation thirteen. That's the verse you need to put in your heart as we study this. If we say that we have no sin, then the truth is not in us. And the only way you can worship God is by what? Spirit and truth. And here's the second thing. If we say we have no sin in us, or deny sin, then we're calling God a liar. Now, I don't know about you, I don't like to be called a liar. Do you? Take that to the next level. Do you think God likes to be called a liar? Who has the audacity to call God a liar? The devil. The devil has been accusing us for, for forever. God has always defended us through his son Jesus. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. And worse yet, we call him and make him a liar. Folks, we are born in sin. We are all sinners. We are not perfect. We fail and we fall. We need the grace of Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and move on. God doesn't count the mistakes you made. He counts the steps you take forward. God doesn't count the times you fall down. He counts the times you get up. Jesus does not look and bring up our past. If you ever get into an argument, don't bring up the past. Sometimes I'm guilty of that and I admit to it. That's sin. That's wrong. And I always tell my wife the same thing. What's past is past. What's bones is bones. Don't dig up bones. Let it lie. What well, did this in the past? God does not care. He cares about your future. The devil brings up the past. The devil is the one that brings up your mistakes and your faults. The devil brings up that you're not a good Christian. The devil makes you feel real small so that you can stay away from Jesus. The devil is the one that deceives you and distorts you. Finally, when he gets you by himself, he will try to possess you. He will try to get you. Let's look here also. What to do about evil. Two well young grown men in their teens came to the door when dad was pastoring. They had white shirts and nice ties. 
They were, oh my God, yes sir, no sir, well-mannered young men. They had a Bible with them. Dad invited them in. Offered them some of the drink, coffee, water. These two young men would have been the envy of any mother that had a daughter. And said, I want my daughter to marry these young men. They were Jehovah's Witnesses. The young men were not evil per se, but what they were spreading, what they were giving was evil. Evil is something that has many disguises. And the devil uses every one of those disguises to get evil into our lives. This evening I'm going to make it very clear. <clears throat> the devil has a very powerful force. He has people in government. He has people in the religious world. He has people in schools. He has people in your stores. He has people everywhere doing his dirty work. There are judges. They're in the Supreme Court. Any philosophy that is not of Christ, that is not of God, that advocates evil and calls evil good is sin. All you have to do is look at Isaiah 5.20. And the Bible says very clearly what the prophet Isaiah said. Well, what to those that call evil good and good evil? That was a long time ago. So, let's get into our notes here, 139. The, passage, the pages of Scripture are bursting with warnings about false prophets and teachers. Again, we go all, you can go all the way back to Genesis where there have been false prophets and false teachers. The first Antichrist was in the, in the book of Genesis. Revelation 13 describes two end-time deceivers. There will be two major leaders that will come upon the scene. When will this happen? This will happen at the beginning of the tribulation. This will happen after we are gone. To all those people that are post-trib, I, I don't understand you. You want the bride of Christ to be here when the Antichrist is here. Does that make sense? No, it does not make sense. <clears throat> Let me go here to prove the point. Let's go to uh, the, the Thessalonians. And I want to show you the time period here. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Okay. Second Thessalonians chapter two, starting in verse uh, verse one. I'm gonna go verse one through ten. This sets the stage about the introduction of the man of sin. Now we beseech you, brethren. Now this was written in 54 AD, by the way. Why is that important? Why is that time period so important to remember? 54 AD, that's only 54 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And 54 years after that time, when the church was started, when the empowerment of the Holy Spirit came upon in the book of Acts, already during that time there was a threat of the Antichrist. They were talking about the Antichrist back then. Not the Antichrist that have come upon the scene. Not your Hitlers, not your Stalins, or Mussolini's, or Bin Laden's, or what have you. But we're talking about the Antichrist. And it says here in verse 1, Now we beseech you, brother, by the coming of our Lord. Now listen to this. This is another point. I'm going to hammer this home. So all you post-trippers, get ready. We beseech you by, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He did not say after the, rap after the tribulation. No. He focused and told the church, we beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about what? When Jesus Christ comes and takes us home. He was the one that brought up the rapture. He was the one that taught about the rapture. And by our gathering, listen to this, by our gathering together unto Him. Preachers would have you think this is when Jesus Christ comes back, right? No. Read that verse again. 
we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our what? Gathering together unto Him. Do you understand what that means? We are gathered unto Him. We go to Him. He doesn't come to us. We go to Him. And all you have to do is, it's um, when you go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Look at the pattern. Look what happens here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I want you to see which verse in the Bible that tells us that Jesus sets foot on this earth when he comes again. He never says, in, this, in these verses that Paul teaches, he never said that Jesus is going to set his, fir, his foot on this planet. We're going to go to him. Look what it says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. And this is for all the coast trippers out there. I want you to answer this question because you cannot. Go to verse 15. For we, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. Those that have gone on in the Lord are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Many people say it's Gabriel. Some say it's Michael. We don't know, but it's an archangel, one of the two archangels. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. First. These are those that are already asleep. These are not the ones that will be martyred. I've heard that before. No. These are those that have already been asleep. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, we, we which remain and alive shall be what? Caught up together with them in the clouds. That's the gathering together unto Him. To meet the Lord in the what? Air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. The second coming of Jesus Christ is not the rapture. They're two totally different things. And that's what messes people up that are strippers. They think that Jesus Christ, when He comes back out of heaven, they think that's the second coming. That's not. We have shown you in these verses that Jesus does not step one foot on this planet. Instead, He what? He calls us to meet Him in the air. Interesting. Very, very, very interesting. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. All this is a, all these are pieces of the puzzle that make the that uh, create the same picture. Look at what it says here in First Thessalonians one verse ten. This is Paul, the same one, and listen to what he says. And to wait for his son from heaven, against fifty four A.D., whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered. And notice in verse ten, delivered us from the wrath to come. He's not talking about the wrath of sin. He already did that on the cross. He's talking about the God's wrath, the tribulation, what? To come. Hammer it home, baby. Go here to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. The next time someone tells you this, get these verses out, explain to them the chronological order, and explain to them the context, what's, what is going on. It says here in 1 Thessalonians, Chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed. That word appointed means ordained. That means that God from the beginning, before we were even existed, He appointed us to wrath. That's what people are saying. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. But to obtain salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 10. Who died for us that we, whether we what, awake or sleep, we should live together with him. He's talking about the rapture. Look at verse 9. Jesus says he did not appoint us to wrath, but to what? Obtain, to receive salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. Who died for us that whether we what, awake or sleep, we should live together with Him.
These verses go in order of the warning and how the rapture is going to happen, when it happens, why it happens, and the reason for it. So after the rapture, that has already, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, has already happened, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, then we see the order of what's going to happen. Why does God take the church, why does God take his people in the rapture during this time? What is going to happen that, necess that necessitates God to take his people out? Why would God send His Son to come and get us and take us home? What is going to happen on this planet that God has the urgency to send His Son Jesus and Jesus says, it's time to come up now. What is going to happen that would, to this poor pitiful planet, that we have to be out of the way? Now, I, if a house is burning or a house is on fire, my concern is to get my family out. I don't care about pictures, documents. I don't care about stuff or things. I care about what? Getting my family out. Getting, and yet the pets too. We can't forget the pets because I know Kathy will throw fit. But we got to get the pets out. Yep. They should do. We feed and pay their bills. But I'm just saying, we get the kids out. I get my family out of that burning house. Jesus is going to come and get us out before all hell will break loose on this planet. Mm -hmm. If your house is on fire, this is a trick question. What would you get first? I'll get my marriage license. You can get another one at the courthouse. I'll get my TV. You can win down the line. Name one thing, folks, really. Name one thing that's irreplaceable, and that's what you get out first. You get your family out, right? You get your pets, your loved, you get your loved ones out. Jesus is coming for his loved ones to get out because there is a house that's going to burn. You don't leave your bride in danger. You don't leave your bride hanging. You rescue her. That's what Jesus does with the church. Jesus protects the bride, loves the bride, and watches out for the bride. In return, now women, this is not one side now. You listen to the man, support your man, and encourage your man. Don't berate your man. Don't criticize your man. Don't think you know more. Don't think he's oh, I'm one of the pets of the family. If God wanted you to, work, if God wanted you to be a man, He would have created you a man. That's the truth. God does not make mistakes. We do. He does not. Look what it says here in chapter two, verse one. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, when rapture, and by our gathering together unto him. How? When we're caught up in the air together with him. The word unto means to point to him. Verse 2, that you should not be shaken in mind or be troubled, troubled by the spirit or by word or by the letters from us as the day of Christ is at hand. That you should not be what? Shaken in mind or troubled. You know there are people that worry about this and they shouldn't. And Paul was telling to the church of Thessalonica, don't worry about this. Your worry is not going to delay the rapture. Your worry is not going to do anything about the rapture. It's going to happen. Okay. Focus on yourself. Get yourself right with God. What's going to happen is beyond our control. It's going to happen. But look at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Two major things have to happen for this to happen. Number one is the falling away. Falling away from what? Falling away from truth. 
then the man of what? The man of sin, who is the son of perdition. Perdition is an old English word. And when I mean by English, it's European in origin. The word perdi perdition in theological terms means hell. The son of hell. If you look at it in the Greek, the word perdition means hell. Now why in the world would Paul describe this man as the son of hell? Why? Why would he give this person such a very, really demonic name? Notice here, the man of sin be revealed. When you reveal something, you reveal something that's already there, right? So during this time, I am asked the question, will we know who the Antichrist is? Yes, we will. Now, how will we know this? Well, the Spirit will lead us and guide us through the Word of God and through the unction of the Holy Spirit, which is that, uh, that movement that He has within our hearts and minds, He will show us and prepare us for two things. Number one, get ready. Get ready. It's time to go home. Number two, that dude over there, he's the one. I think God would give us a short window, and I mean short, when I mean short, I mean short, to tell people, get ready. Jesus is coming. This is not who he says he is. He says he has the answers to the world's problems. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He mocks God. He mocks His Word. He mocks heaven. He mocks the people. He mocks God's people. He is the one. And I believe that the Holy Spirit will, what's the word? Unveil us, the spiritual eyes, and we will see who He is and say, that's the one. You no good for nothing, conniving, low life, no, I mean, God forgive me, I cannot say that, but you get the idea. I thought Christians were loving people, Pastor. We love God, but we don't love Him? Really? Oh, these are the same people that make sin, that have excuses for sin, right? Well, your honey's coming. The Bible says here, except they're coming or falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the sin of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Or that is worship. The first thing that he is going to do after the revelation in the Jewish temple that he is the Messiah. And all you Jews out there, I'm telling you right now, your Messiah has come, gone, and is coming back. His name is Jesus, Yeshua. He is not the one that will come upon the scene and sit in the Jewish temple and call himself God. He is not your Messiah. That is not your Messiah. That is the devil in the flesh. He is a liar, a deceiver, and he wants to destroy Israel. The United States and the United Nations hear this very clearly. You don't tell the nation of Israel what to do. That's not your country. You don't tell her which borders are right and which borders are legal. That is God's doing. You do not mess with the nation of Israel. Woe unto us. Woe unto us that, are, that side against Israel. Woe unto us that side against God's people. Woe unto us that turn our back on the nation of Israel. Woe unto us that actually have the audacity to go against the nation of Israel. We need people that love the nation of Israel and government to, to bless them and to help them. We need to, to protect Israel. We need to be good buddies and BFFs with the nation of Israel. Amen. So that he that is, now listen to this. this. You want to talk about blasphemy? This is the ultimate blasphemy. You want to, I was asked one time, Pastor, what is the greatest act of blasphemy in the Bible? It's in verse 4. He will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So that he as God will sit in the temple of God. Listen to this. Sit on the throne of God saying he is God. Do you remember Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14 last week? Lucifer has always had this complex about him. He wants to be worshipped 
as God. Do you remember that? He was in heaven along with Michael and Gabriel. And the once three amigos became two because Lucifer, who at that time was the most powerful of the three archangels, wanted to be worshipped as God. And Lucifer, who was in charge of the heavenly worship in heaven, who was in charge of the music, and the reason I bring that up is because in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13, it talks about one that was encrusted with diamonds and topaz, one that was beautifully made and bright as the stones. And it also talks about this person that had the gift of pipes and tabrets and, viol and, and uh, harps. Why would God bless such a one with that incredible beauty and power in Ezekiel 28, 13? Because he was in charge of the worship of heaven. Get it? He was in charge of the worship of heaven. Then when sin came into his heart, pride and ego, he wanted to be worshipped as the one in heaven. Do you understand? Do you see the parallel? If you look in Ezekiel 28, 13, look what it says here. It describes the king of Tyrus as such in light, in parallelism. Look at Ezekiel 28. I'm going to show you something. This is going to really, really boggle your mind. Ezekiel 28, 13. Got it? Verse 13, Thou hast seen and eaten the garden of God. Thou hast seen and eaten the garden of Eden, the garden of God. Who was there in the garden of Eden on the tree? Slithering down to meet Eve. It was Satan, what? Satan, he knows the garden of Eden, he was there, remember? Precious stone was thy covering. Listen to this. Sardius, Tobaz, and the diamond. The barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. This is how he was created. He was the best of the best. He was blessed with precious stones. The workmanship of thy tabrets, and the word tabrets is timbrels, pipes, a wind instrument, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Let me ask you this question. What makes God God? What makes God the only true living God? And I want to get you all with this. You people out there, you are propagating a blasphemy. You have blasphemed. You need to repent of your sins because what you are saying is part of your religion. You know what? I'll write it out. I'm tired of this. That's here. We had a precious lady from this church go to one of these meetings. It changed your life forever. She's not going to go back. It scared her silly. She came to us. Had a, I think the reason she invited us for lunch not only was it her birthday, but she wanted to confess. She wanted to get it out. She needed to just vent. Poor woman. You say that Jesus, in your, in your teachings, and I know your teachings, I studied this, you say Jesus was created. You know how blasphemous that is? Jesus was never created. He always was and is. He is the I Am. He is the Creator. He is God. What makes God God? You cannot create God. You cannot overpower God. You cannot take the throne away from God. That's what makes Him God. No one, God is the creator of all things. God is overpowered. There's no one more powerful. There is no one equal to God. He is the Almighty. His Son Jesus, He is the what? I am. I am the creator. He is God. He is spirit. He is the word of God fulfilled in the flesh. He is God. He was never created. He, God, can you, can you, 
Imagine that, that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, was created. He is God. You don't create God. That's what you teach. Don't lie to me, because I know y'all. I heard enough of your young men that come up and you and you indoctrinate these young men on the way to hell with this philosophy because that is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Look what it says here. And thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Lucifer was created. Do you understand what I'm saying? He is created. He's a creature. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. Listen to this. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have said thee so. Thou was upon the holy mount of God. Thou walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He has seen it all in heaven. He was there. But look at verse 15. Thou was perfect. You were complete in thy ways from the day that thou was what? Created. Till what? Iniquity was found in thee. Till sin was found in thee. Until that pride, that ego originated, was found in him. If you look at verses 13 and 14, he was in the Garden of Eden, right? Look how he was created. He was the most beautiful of all archangels. He was the one. He was created even with music. Remember, like tablets and pipes are part of his being. You know what that means? That means that God actually gifted him with the gift of music. He knows music. He led the angels in choir up there. Okay? He understands music. He understands how music affects your mind and your soul. I want you to listen very carefully out there. Uh, I said, preface this with a warning, and I'm doing this for a reason. If the devil knows how to use music then, don't you think he knows how to use music today? Now, what did I just say about the devil? He wants to get your heart, your mind, and eventually your soul. He has to find ways to get in there. And he will use anything, anyone. It doesn't matter who it is. If they're not Christian or godly, he will use that person to try to get to you. And one of the ways he does is music. Have you ever heard of Black Sabbath? Yeah. Why do they call themselves Black Sabbath? Here's why. Black Sabbath is their band of occultists. Look at the jewelry they wear. One of them has a 666 as a necklace. Check it out. You think I'm kidding? Check it out. I dare you. Look at that tattoos they have on. They're not just tattoos or artwork. They're demonic. They're tattoos of the devil. They're tattoos of mocking Jesus upside down. You think that's cute? You think that's part of the act? I have news for you. Anything you do for the devil, he will notice. Anything you say for the devil, he will take note of. You get his attention, he, is, he will never let go of you. He is like the bad, jealous ex-girlfriend that won't go away, or the bad, jealous ex-boyfriend that won't go away. He will consume you, he will come after you, he will hunt you down. What you have just done is that you have put a calling card on the devil, and he's coming after you. And here's the thing, you know, after every, uh, after every concert... They had services for the devil to come, for the young kids to come and give their lives to the devil. KISS, you did the same thing. You know what KISS stands for? Knights in Satan Service. The devil wants our kids. He wants to attack our kids. He wants to get a hold of our kids. He wants to get our kids' minds and hearts through music. Backward masking, the Beatles started that. Number nine, number nine, number nine. You know what that means? It means turn me on, dead man. Turn me on, dead man. Look it up. I'm not lying. Queen. You know why they were called Queen? Give you one guess why they were called Queen. Woo! 
Why didn't they call themselves king? The agenda of the music group king was to radicalize and, and legalize gay and lesbian relationships. Freddie Mercury. Why did he call himself Mercury? Mercury is a common term in gay circles that means that you are gay. And he died from AIDS. How did he get AIDS? Mm. Another one bites the dust. Backward masking. Play it backwards. What does it say? I'm going to ride on the board. You know what? You can't sue me because it's the truth. And in court, I will prove it to you. Another one bites the dust was the most popular song of the 80s. I remember next to Smiley, every time we beat a football team, which was once in the blue moon, we played that song. I'm sorry, I had, it was the truth. Write this down and play it for yourself. Look it up YouTube. It's fun to what? Smoke. Turn on. And it says that all through the song. I'm sorry to poop on your part. But that's the truth. Let me ask you this question. Why would the devil go through so much so much time to put messages like this on another one by the dust by Queen, who advocated gay lesbianism? It's all demonic. I'm showing you this because this is the truth. I went to a seminary that had the guts to tell the truth. Not seminaries that prepare preachers to be businessmen. They prepare preachers to be preachers. They prepare preachers to teach the truth, to, to look for the truth and seek the truth. Sixteen. Verses sixteen and seventeen. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst with, of, of thee with violence that thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mount of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, and I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Look at verse 17 very carefully. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. This is the time when, when the devil that is on the ground, he's not in hell. He's roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. This is the time in verse 17 when the Antichrist will gather the kings and make a one world government. And a one world religion. Verse 17 is the beginning. You look at verses 13 through 16, you see what has happened. Verse 17 is going to be the fulfillment and revelation in which the Antichrist will come to fruition. Let me look here at 139 for this fascinating study. Look what it says here in 139. The pictures of scripture are bursting with warnings about false prophets and teachers. Revelation 13 describes two end time deceivers. One is a future political leader. Now notice this, a future political leader, the Antichrist, Revelation 13, 1 through 10. The other is his chief lieutenant, the most powerful false prophet of all time, who will force, notice this, who will force the world to worship the Antichrist. Now how in the world are you going to force the whole world to worship the Antichrist? How is one person going to galvanize and unite every human being except for 144,000 and those that are martyred? How are they going to be forced to worship the Antichrist? Do you remember in the, in the, in the book of Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar had his statue of himself built? What preluded the worship of that statue? What was done first? Huh? They play music, right? They played the music as a signal for the other people to come and worship 
the statue. Now, why is that brought up? Nebuchadnezzar made a statue of himself. Being the old, you want to talk about ego? Nebuchadnezzar had a lot of ego, all right? He made a statue of himself in the book of Daniel so that he could be worshipped. As a king, he was worshipped. Now, where did he get that from? He got it from Egypt. Remember the pharaohs? They were worshipped as gods, right? Where did Egypt get that from? They got it from Nimrod. He was worshipped. He wanted to be worshipped as a god. Where did Nimrod get that from? Satan. At the time when the time when the scat when the statue was built, music played. They played the music. What do you think is going to happen when the Antichrist comes? How is he going to alert the whole world when they're worshiping? He's going to do it through music. There is going to be a universal call that the de that the devil. Have you ever heard of a syn synoptic hypnosis? Have you ever heard of that? Synoptic hypnosis. How many you heard? You probably said, hey, "What's that preacher talking about?" Synoptic hypnosis. Have you ever heard of that? Okay. Synoptic hy hypnosis is this: people through messages and music can get their point across subtly. A lot of people think we think forwards. We think backwards. God has created our brain to receive messages backwards and is processed in our frontal lobe, which the brain comprehends as a message. See, the devil knows how we work in our brains. So what he does is that he uses synodic hypnosis, which is the cunning of music. Did you know that music for a short time can hypnotize you? Try it one day. Try listening to Elvis Presley's Hound Dog. Okay? How many of you all start singing the Hound Dog in your car? When you hear music, you start singing, right? You start, and you can't get that song out of your head, right? How many of you have gone through that? Mm -hmm. Okay. That is synodic hypnosis. In other words, there's a message in that song that your brain keeps on playing over and over. Pastor, you're, you're cuckoo. No, I'm not cuckoo. The devil would want you to believe that I'm cuckoo. Do I look like a cuckoo person? Really? Do I look like a rich man asking for money? Do I look like I live in a mansion? Do I look like, oh my God, you know what? I go out of my way just to insult and offend you? No, I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to tell you the truth. I'm trying to open your eyes. I'm trying to get your ears to hear. People, wake up. This is not playtime. This is real. The devil is here. He wants your what? Heart, mind, and soul. Heart, mind, and soul. He wants you deceived. He wants you lost. He uses music. That song that keeps on playing in your head has a message, and that brain is trying to comprehend what it is. Music has made people commit suicide. No, they don't. They put the gun. Where do you think they get it from? It's hypnotic hypnosis. Music, the sound of music equals the, the brain waves that we have in our brain. Have you ever seen music played out and you see the waves of music, like sound? Have you seen sound has waves? Okay. Sound waves are like this, right? Guess what this is? Brain waves. Guess what this is? That's your heart. Our body fun, uh, functions on waves. It goes in cycles. This is music. This is your brain. This is your heart. I'm showing you and teaching you something you probably don't hear at your church. This is how the devil gets in there. He gets in your brain through the music because they have the similar waves. The waves of music is similar to the waves of the brain. That's why you have a song in your head that goes, oh, you can't get rid of it. Because the waves of the music is mimicking the waves of your brain, and your brain is trying to comprehend which is which. It's in there. Your heart goes in waves, ups and downs. Music affects what you think, and music affects what? What you feel. Music affects what you think, music affects what you feel. Music affects what you think, music affects what you feel. There's the proof. 
So the next time you listen to music and you can't get that song out of your head, that's why. And who do you think was in charge of music? I just proved to you in the Bible what it was. Who do you think was in charge of it? Okay. Let me read on it. We're at 139. I know what we're getting. I, I like to preface a lot. I like to teach a lot. So it's easier when we get into it. Even today, Satan uses various people. Listen to this. This is this this made me laugh. First of all, the most powerful false prophet of all time will force the world to worship the Antichrist. Of course, if you don't have the 666, you will be killed. Okay. Even today, Satan uses various people. Listen to this. Let me read this to you. I'm not lying to you. Satan uses various people, especially religious leaders, to spread his lies under a brilliant cloak of trickery. Oh, the devil can't do that. They're religious. Yes, he can. Judas was one of the twelve in the church. Who do you think betrayed Jesus? It was Judas. Judas, and listen to this. This is for all you people that appoint yourselves and anoint yourselves. I anoint myself. You can't anoint yourself. Only God can anoint you. Judas was the only one not chosen and not called by God. Remember that? So if your pastor is not called by God, walk up run out the door. If your pastor was not chosen, called, and authorized by God, get up, walk out the door. I don't care he and his first lady are there. Get up, walk out the door. I don't care if, if, if they have the eloquence of President Obama. Get up and walk out the door. I'm trying to hit everyone that drive by at all at once. Get up and walk out the door. Jesus chose a shepherd boy named David to be the future king of Israel. Jesus chose a scaredy cat named Jonah to spread his messages to Nineveh about the coming wrath of God. Jesus chose the weak things of this world to confound the wise. Jesus chose 12 ordinary men and made them extraordinary through him. Jesus chose a queen of Jewish descent to save her country against mighty Gentile rulers named Esther. A young Jewish girl who was found pure in her faith in God bore our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus doesn't look for the powerful or the mighty or the strong or the beautiful or the handsome. He looks for the people that will do his bidding, that will submit to his will and follow his word. Those are the people that he calls. And he makes them. Again, he does not look for the biggest, the best, the strongest, the brightest. He looks for those that are willing to be filled with his spirit and submit to him. He's not looking for leaders or bosses. He's looking for servants. He's looking for people that will follow his word and his way. He does not need help. He does not need a co-pilot. He does not want our opinions. He does not ask for our, for our ways. He says, come and what, what did Jesus say? Come and follow me. Don't worry about anything else. I got you covered. Just come and follow me. Satan uses various people, especially religious leaders. Charles Taze Russell was way wrong. Mohammed really wrong. Popes, you've been wrong from the beginning. Jim Jones, idiot, killed himself, probably burning in hell if he didn't repent. Religious leaders have led people the wrong way and have led countless souls to hell. Look what it says here, to counter his deceptive ways, listen to this, we must wield God's weapons of what? Wisdom, knowledge, and discernment. If your church is not teaching you and really teach you, I'm not talking about puppy dog stories or one verse and then expound on it. I don't know what that is. But if God, if, you, if they're not teaching you specifics here, proof here, proof here, proof here, proof here. If they're not teaching you, you're going to be lost because God expects the church 
to teach His people. God expects His church to lead the people. God expects His church to strengthen the people. When I went to school, I expected to learn something, right? When I went to college, I expected to learn something. When you go to church, you expect to be taught. You expect to be fed. You expect to be strengthened. You expect to be encouraged. You expect to be enlightened. And Jesus will do that. If you seek Him, what does He say? Those who knock, the door will be opened. Those who seek, they will be found. Those who ask, it will be given unto Him. He will, he will let you know the truth. You may not like the truth, but He will tell you the truth. Look what it says in 139. Of course, over the course of our lives, we have probably been victimized by a con artist or bamboozled by a charlatan at one time or another. Everyone has done that. However, of all the cons we might fall prey to, the most destructive deception comes from a religious fake who deals in counterfeit truth. 140 behind this. Revelation chapter 12 ended with a frantic with Satan frantically seeking to destroy God's people. Satan frantically seeking to destroy God's people. Hmm. Having been frustrated, having been frustrating in his vicious attempts to wipe Israel off the map. Then in Revelation 13, 1 through 10, we witness the rise of a political and military dictator. Remember that. He's going to be powerful in the political scene and in the military scene. That's very important. Known as the Antichrist. Did you know that in the United Nations, they are seeking a president that has a political and military clarity to world government. You know who's campaigning for that job? Ahmadinejad from from Iran, the idiot. You're not. He's not the Antichrist. No. Okay. No. Miss, no. 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 He's not. But uh, uh, he's uh, no. Uh, we, we witness a rise of a political and military dictator, the Antichrist. However, Satan's most sinister and destructive weapon against mankind is about to appear on the earthly stage. This is the person that's going to galvanize. This is the person that's going to do the dirty work. The dirty work. The Antichrist's lieutenant. He is a master of religious deception. He is a master of religious deception. He is a master of religious deception. I plead with you and I beg of you, study the Word of God. Be in tune with the Holy Spirit. Dig down and make it a point to pray. Because you're going to need all that because the devil is going to test you and test you and test you. And if you don't know what the heck you're talking about, he's going to deceive you. And the devil is unfair. He plays for keeps. If you're witnessing to a soul that's on the fence and you don't know the Word of God and you lose that soul, that is something that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Because we're not talking about someone referring a person to a bad restaurant or a bad bakery or a bad mechanic or a bad doctor. This is worse. We're talking about someone's soul. And when I meet young men at the gym, and I think that's why God puts me there, I have to be ready with the Word of God and to tell the truth straight out. It's like a Lord. If you hire a Lord and you don't know what, if he, doesn't, he or she doesn't know what the heck they're doing, do you want that person to represent you? No. George Zimmerman had lawyers. Both were professors of law. They knew what the heck they were talking about, and they won. People that know the law, people that know the precedents of the law, people that know how to, how to interpret the law will work for you, and they're good. If you are an agent of Jesus Christ and a child of God, let me ask you this. Does every child know their father? Do you know your father? 
I knew my father very well. I knew my father and he knew me. My father never once threatened to divorce my mother. My father never once hit my mother. My father never once abused us or, or our mother. Our father never once did stupid things and brought, a, brought bad attention and bad behavior to the church or to his family. My father was a man. He stuck it out and he made it work. He wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but he stayed in and fought to the end. That is what it takes when you're a child of God. You're going to have to stick in there and fight to the end. The devil's going to go after your family. The devil's going to go after you. He's going to make you say, he's going to say, okay, Kathy, or, or Teresa, or, or anyone. We're going to test you. We're going to see how good you are. Does God love everybody? No. What do you mean? Do you think he loves the devil? You can get him right there. Did God love Pharaoh? Pharaoh, what the hell? Did he love Judas? Gone. See, you don't hear that, do you? Does God play favorites? Yeah, he does. He chose Isaac, remember? Cain and Abel. He chose Abel. He accepted his, his uh, sacrifice, remember? He didn't accept Cain's. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ishmaelites were rejected. Yeah, God plays favorites. God chose the nation of Israel out of all the countries of the world. He chose the nation of Israel to be his. He plays favorites. Yeah, he does. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. That's the God that we have. Now, let me, let me go here to the religious deception. There are three things that, that the devil is using in the religious world. And we need to go over this quickly. And then next Sunday, we're going to, well, I don't know. I may review this. It depends. It's our first time. Okay, three things that the, the devil uses in religion. First of all, he wants to distort who God is. Secondly, we want you to debate the Word. Is this really the Word of God? Is this is this actually is this actually God's Word? Number three. The denial, and we said this in the beginning, of sin. Those are the three things that he's focused on right now. He wants to distort who God is. He wants you to paint, he wants to paint a picture of God of what he isn't. He wants you to debate and question the word of God, God's will. He wants you to question God's will. He wants you to question God's word. Thirdly, he wants you to deny that there is any sin. In other words, like Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe unto those that call good evil and evil good. God, uh, the devil wants you to make light and minimize the effects of sin. He wants you to say that sin is not that bad. He wants, he, he, we, like tattoos. You know, it's not a sin to have a tattoo. Yeah, it is. And what the devil's going to do is that he's going to make you, he's going to get into the hearts and minds of people says, do you really want to worship a God that that's picky and pity? Do you want to be with a God that's really picky about those things? You see how he works? Do you want to be with a God that questions everything you say and do? And here he is. What does he do being two-faced? He accuses you of everything you say and do, right? He wants to get you to think that God is too strict. He wants you to get you to think that God demands too much out of you. He wants you to get you to question God. He wants you to debate, to debate God. He, God, how come I don't have a person in my life right now? Time is ticking. Hey, God, I got news for you. Sarah was 90 when she had a son. So your clock's not ticking. If you want a child, it may be till 90 to have a child. Oh, I can't do that in my body. God doesn't care about your physical condition or anything. He's God. He can make you healthy at 90 and so, more healthy than someone that's 20. He's God. Amen? He's God. Amen? He's God. Amen. He is God. That's the true God. 
God doesn't go on our plans. He doesn't go by our agenda or our time clock. He's God. He could turn back time. He's God. He could heal diseases. He's God. He can make a way when there's no other way, like the Red Sea. He is God. You don't tell God what He can and cannot do. He does at His time and His way. He is God. That's my dad always used to say. That's where I get that from. He's God. The devil would have you think that God is on our time period. No, He's not. The devil would have you think that God obeys what we want. Do you do everything for your kids? Hold on. Don't do it. No. If you want school kids, do everything for them. If you want adults, make them walk halfway. Make. You remember when your child took the first steps? Were you happy? Were you happy? Okay. Why? Why were you happy? Because your baby got up and took the first steps. They walked. Your baby got up on their own two feet and walked. Did that make you happy? You took pictures of it, put it on Facebook. You took pictures and put it in an album. You took pictures and put it on the wall. You and they walked. Before you run, you gotta walk. Before you jog, you gotta walk. Before you get to one place to another, you gotta put one foot in front of the other. God is going to, here's what I'm telling you, God is going to do that with you. Before you can do anything, you've got to walk in the Lord. Amen? Mm -hmm. you got to take up your cross and walk. Do you think God spoils us? Does He spoil us? No. Did He spoil Jonah? Did He let Jonah get away with it? No, He had a big Shamu and swallowed it up for three days and three nights. Had to come to Jesus' meeting in the belly of a big fish. you think He spoiled Moses? Moses was in the desert for 40 years. Now, I don't know about you, but being in the desert for 40 years is a long time for me. Did he give him a Dom Perrier and lobster? You remember when the people of Israel were crying out for food? Did he get him a Diet Coke? <laughs> Chocolate milk? Lobster. No, he says here, you're going to get water from a rock, and I'm going to get you quail from up there. You're going to get manna from heaven, the best food of all. That's what you're going to get. Does that make God unfeeling, uncompassionate, uncaring just because He doesn't spoil us? Does that make God any less God? No. He is God. The worst thing, you think He spoiled David? He took His firstborn son. How many of us can handle the loss of a child? God says, He's with me. I'm going to bless you with another one, but that first one's mine. You have sinned greatly. You repented of your sin. Great. But that's going to cost you. See, that's the God that people don't want to hear about. They want to hear of a God that lets you get away with everything. They want to, they want, uh, they want to hear a God that, that lets you get away with everything, that there are no consequences for their actions, and that God turns a winks at sin and just says, you know what, that's all right, we'll, we'll get it next time. If you spoil your kids, like you give them everything they want, and this is for you up there, you're not showing who God really is because God does not spoil us. I'm telling you right now. God gives us what we need, not what we want. God gives us what we need, not what we want. God gives us what we need, not what we want. There was a sign that Kathy saw the other day at the Miller Insurance. Husbands, don't laugh at all your wife's choices. And on the bottom it says, because she chose you. And then I would add under the bottom, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Alright. It's not a sin to help. It's not a sin to help our family. We've got to help our families. Just keep them in the graces of God. But don't don't spoil them. Don't have them live in a fantasy world. Tell them, look, this is reality. You make a bad choice, it affects us, you, and your kids. It affects us you and your job. It affects us you and your health. But God is going to bless you. Here's what you tell him. God could take the mess of your life and clean it up. God could take the mess of your life and make you better than you were before. God could take the mess of your life and, and take the baggage out. God can do that for you. Just come to Him. 
That's what my father did. My father says, stupido, you made a mistake, okay? Okay, but I'm going to help you. Just don't do that again. You put it in my car, you have to pay for it. Just don't do it again, sir. God is that way with us. What did Jesus tell the woman who was called in adultery and they wanted to sell her? What did he tell her? Your sins have been forgiven thee. Go and sin no more. That sounds like a father, doesn't it? He didn't say, you know what? You got a problem. You, you have a condition. You can't help yourself. No, he didn't say that. He says, stop what you're doing and go and sin no more. That sounds like a father. A father says, don't do this because this is wrong. A father tells you what is right from wrong. It's not playtime all the time. God, God doesn't play patty cake with us and wink at us. He tells us like it is and straight. He's God. The devil, however you think otherwise, but he is our father. Debate the word. This is God's word. This is the truth right here. I trust every word in this book. Praise God. This is God's word. This is his promise. I trust every promise. I believe in every prophecy. This is God's word. He wrote the book. I believe the book. He said it. That settles it. This is God's word. Praise God. The devil is a liar. He can mock this book. I won't listen to him. He can debate this book. I will ignore him. This is God's word. Sin. First John one, verse eight. First John chapter one, verse eight. Sin. Say there is no sin, the truth is not in us, and we make God to be a liar. So the next time you listen to music, be careful what you listen to. Those are the two that we have to take. If the house is on fire, those are the two we have to take out. Um, just pray. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you in prayer. And we thank you for this word. Lord, thank you for revealing to us some of the walls of the devil. Thank you for revealing to us some of the methods and the tricks that the devil uses. Your word says that we have to get the truth out to expose the unfruitful works of darkness in the book of Ephesians. It says that. It says in your word that one of the duties of the church is to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. And that's what we have done this evening. We've started to. Lord, we have shown your church these are your people. They're not mine. These are your people. You're, they say by your blood, they're led by your spirit, and they follow your word. I'm, I'm a servant. I follow you. But those that are listening out there, Lord, open their hearts and minds to hear this word and to see this truth. This is real. This is not. This is not casual. This is not frivolous. This is very real. This is concerning their lives. This is concerning them. And Heavenly Father, we also pray that that we we also pray for this church at Crosswalk. We're going to be four years old next week. And we have gone through some ups and downs as a church in four years. There have been times when we, we've had as many as 20 and we had as few as three. But your word says where two or more are gathered, your spirit, you are there, your presence is there among the midst of us. So we trust that. And we know that this is a real thing because you're the head of this church Lord. we submit to you and follow you. You didn't call this church to be a mega church or to be the biggest and the brightest. You, you, didn't, give, you didn't give this church a political agenda, a worldly agenda. You, you call this church to be a teaching church and to preach and teach the truth and to expose the lies and the dark, darkness that is out there. We're not here to make friends. We're not here to make favorites. We're here to serve you. We're here to follow you, what you say. We're here to be led by your spirit, not by man's whim or will. And for those people out there right now, Heavenly Father, that are being tortured by the devil, that are being bondage to him, Lord, we just pray in the name of Jesus you will free their souls from the power of the devil, that you will free their minds and their hearts, that you will free their bodies from 
open their eyes and ears to see the truth, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, the, the days are getting shorter. The time is coming closer when we go home. Heavenly Father, every unsaved soul out there, Lord, we pray for them in the name of Jesus. Those that are our friends, those that are in our family, those people that we know about, we pray for them, Lord. They are at the top of our list right now. We pray for their salvation. We pray that you will bring them to Jesus Christ. Because that is the only way they're going to be saved, Lord, is through your Son, through the blood of your Son, through Him and Him alone. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that this word will go out. We pray that this word will not only bless and edify people, but encourage and enlighten them as well. Pray to give us the strength. Pray that you give us the words. Pray that you will give us the mind to retain this word and to use your word. Because your word is power. Your word is powerful to, to tell others of Jesus Christ. And if they have a question, give us the answer quickly to answer their questions with your word. Not with our opinions. Not with our judgments but only through your word. Your word is that powerful that it can change their life. Our word doesn't do anything. Your word is everything. We trust your word. We don't debate your word. Heavenly Father, we know who you are, and we want to know the real God. We want to know the real Jesus. Not what the world says or what other churches say. We want it through a personal relationship with you. That is the only way we're going to know the real Jesus, is through that personal relationship with you, Heavenly Father. So we thank you for all your blessings, and we thank you. Heavenly Father, bless us, protect us, and guide us in Christ's name.